TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are live. By the time you see this, we won't be. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK right behind me. You see it. Just a little warning just in case. Twitch.com is where you can catch the live streams. Usernames at the bottom of the screen. And we also got Patreon where we post five to ten times a week. Yeah, a week. Ain't nothing light around here. Patreon is, honestly, man, Patreon's worth it. I don't know. I understand if you're not locked in over there, but it's worth it. <laughs> anyway, man, this is Lad Bible TV. This came out a month ago, and I missed it. That's crazy. Well, I guess I wasn't really into it at this point, but okay. Everyone cracks. Interrogator on inhumane torture being captured and training SAS. You know what it is, man. Talk to me. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. I was born in Leicester and I grew up in Leicester, born in 1977. So none of you remember that because you look all far too young for that. And I lived on an estate just near Victoria Park called Clowden Park. It was all right, a little terrace house. 57? And me, my parents, two brothers, sister, a dog in a three bedroom house. So it was quite tight. And what were you like growing up? Useless. So I was in trouble all the time. I tried to fit in, I tried to be the class joker. I weren't the cleverest at school either, so <laughs> academically I was pretty thick, so I needed to do something different. And yeah, like the same origin story of all the SA interview, SAS interviews I've seen so far. And then as you got older, like progressing into a teenager, what sort of like teenager were you like? Uh, still the same, just always trying to rebel. I had quite long hair, believe it or not. Like that. I did one two at one point too, man. They never believe it when you bald. And to hear. And then why did you decide to join the army? My, one of my friends, he was interested in joining, so I just went to the careers office with him to just sort of hold his hand really because he was quite nervous. And I ended up joining. They were quite clever. They said, "Oh, do you fancy doing the test as well?" I went, "Yeah, I've got the test." And it was like a little barb test he did on a computer. You do a couple of press ups, a couple of pull ups, some sit ups. And then he said, oh, you can join a, a combination of different regiments and stuff. So I ended up joining and they proper duped me into it. Then my mate didn't join. He didn't end up joining. He went to be a manager of a supermarket. So I'm glad I joined the army. I didn't want to manage a supermarket. I kind of done it. And they were so nice. So they're really clever at getting you in. So they get you in. Oh, can you do this? Can you do that? Yeah, can you do this? Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. And then it came to actually signing the Oath of Allegiance, which is where you're a fish of the army's property. And I tied, I thought I'd be nice and smart. I put my hair in a ponytail. That's how long it was. I tied it all back. Oh, Mr. Dilks, you can join now. So I signed it. He went, oh, in this modern army, you can keep that long hair. I was like, can I? And he went, yeah, in a box under your bed, get it cut. So I ended up just <laughs> shaving my head. Just thinking I need to get used to it. And then that was it. Then I was in, signed me for Allegiance and then I joined in September. Yeah. Sixth of September, 1993. I was in. And what was your first role in the army? We jo I went to Chepstow. So it was like a, an apprentice college. So you joined at 16. You you're not allowed to go to war at 16. So we did nine months of just getting thrashed up and down. Normal armies, training weapons, fitness, basic field craft and things like that. And then we did that for nine months. Then we went to Chatham and did our trade training which was, I was a bricklayer. So we went and did- It's like the same thing as America. You take that little test, which they took, and then you go take like the physical test as well. I did all of this stuff. And then you take, um, then you go to uh, boot camp, and then you go to your trade school. I, what did they want me to do for my trade school? It was like an engineer or something they wanted me to do. And after I, they wanted me to go, Fly airplanes for the Navy, like fly jets, fighter jets, and things of that nature. Did that, and then once I'd, I'd finished my bricklaying course, I went to Gibraltar Barracks to do my 
combat engineering, which is where you do water supply, bridging, explosives, all your combat engineering sort of stuff that you'd use as like a field engineer. Nine parachute squadron Royal Engineers, I went to do that after that. And then I stayed there for probably about eight or nine years, he jumping out of planes and blowing stuff up. It was quite cool. And then at one point you, you start to think, this isn't for me, can you tell me about that? Yeah, I'd got, I'd come back from my second Afghanistan at bomb disposal. And I thought, I, I didn't, I, I need to move or do something different. And I'd just been promoted as well. And I went, I'm pretty much looking to get out. One of my old bosses got in touch and said, don't jump the gun. Have you thought about doing this? And it was the interrogation. And I said, well, I've never really considered it. And he was trained in it. And he said, oh, you've probably got a few skills that we could take away from this and you could use in interrogation. So before you leave, do you want to do the sort of trial course for it? And they send you an email with some criteria that you need to practice, you need to read up on. So a bit of equipment, what the role of SEER does, which is search, evade, resist, extract. So it's about the SEER side of life and how that works. And then you go on this little afternoon where you turn up at Chicksands and it was a very strange experience. So you go in and I was nice and smart in a suit. You, you introduce yourself, you go and have a brew. So they've, everything, they've really calmed you down at the time. And then you go outside and then there's three porter cabins. And she goes, oh, this first porter cabin, I want you to go in and with any means sort of possible, just try and build a rapport with a person. I don't really understand what you mean by build a rapport, but just build a rapport. And I want you to sort of Ask, try and get the name out of them and what they do as a job. It's like, this is weird. It's just when you've got 15 minutes. So she just opened the door of this porter cabin. You walk in, they've done it like a pub. So it just looks like a little pub. And there's a bloke sat there, it's just me and him. He just sat there reading a the paper. He was reading one paper and he had the paper next to him. I said, have you finished with that Daily Mail? Yeah. So you're like, ah, <laughs> a bit Alan Partridge ah. Reading the paper. What are you reading there? And he, he's like, oh, nothing. And you've got to try and build that rapport, but you have to just keep trying to talk to him, keep asking. And eventually he sort of warms to you and keeps talking. And it's all to see how you can build that rapport. So you do that first room, then you come out, and then they go, oh, the next room. Um, they've just smashed. It's like an escape room of, of interrogations. <laughs> into your car. All I want you to do is really, they've smashed your car, they don't care. They're being really rude to you. And all I want you to do is just shout at them for five minutes, but you're not allowed to shout directly into their ears. So you go, oh, I reckon I can do that. It's a bit easier. You open the door and there's just a five foot woman stood there. Like just smiling at you. And it's the really unnatural thing to do is just go and start berating and shouting at a person who looks really vulnerable. So you've got to shout at them for five minutes, just call them all of the names under the sun and just go for it. And then they come in and go, No lie, I would have walked in. What the F are you smiling at? Huh? What's so funny? <laughs> Thank you, Ian. And then they bring you back outside and they go, Right, the last room, you've just got to stay quite calm. You go in there and then there's just two big burly blokes just going, Yeah. And you walk in, the door closes and they're just grabbing you, pointing at you. Yeah, what the f is going on here? I'm still in the army, aren't I? And you think, what is going on? It was so realistic. And then they assess you on how you're doing that. And then door, you come out, door closes, and then they go, is there any questions for us, Ian? Oh, no, we'll be in touch. And then that's it. You get back in your car and drive out of camp and go, what's just happened then? That's the bizarrest thing I've ever had happen to me. I got a, a phone call saying, would you like to come on the course? And then I stayed in the army then. So it's like one of the best things I did, really. You turn up on the first day, you meet this weird bunch of people that are all on the course. I think there was about uh, 15, 20 of us that all want to be budding interrogators. And then you just go through a load of different scenarios. So you'll go through questions. The more I look at this dude, the more he looks like an interrogator, right? He looked like what you, you ever sat in that police room when they came in there? This is what they look like. In techniques, you go through the cognitive behavioural theory of how the mind and body works under certain circumstances. And then they'll teach you about body language. You do a really in-depth package on body language and non-verbal communications and things like that. That's really interesting. And then you talk to, we have 
uh, two psychs that come on, two civilian psychologists that talk to you about why the body does what it does and the like fight, flight or freeze. You talk about those reactions and why the body reacts like that. And what else is involved on your call? Fight, flight or freeze. You know what's crazy? I just heard about the freeze on. Was we watching something? Or was I watching something in my own time where somebody was like, I freeze. You know, fight or flight? No, I'm a freezer. I don't do anything. I just stand there. Who was I watching? Boss, do you also get interrogated yourself? Yeah. That's the interesting part because it's really bizarre. You do a bit of training, you do some techniques where you go in different rooms and you sort of do a little bit of practicing, as it were. And then you basically get kidnapped and you, they lull you into a false sense of security. So you, you've had a night before where the, you're going out and have a bit of a drink, so you don't get in till late. And then in the morning, they'll do quite a hard PT session. So you do a PT session in the gym. Then you go back to the classroom and they said, oh, we're going to go through interviews now with the boss. So sort of a, a mid-course interview. I'm sat in this chair, and I could see marks on the wall. And they were clearly boot marks, but I was like, why are the marks on the wall? So I was having a cup of tea with the OC, and it was about five minutes. How do you think you're getting on the course? And I was like, yeah, I'm doing all right. I'm feeling good, sir, yeah. Oh, that's great. And then all of a sudden, the door burst. They playing you. He was, they was doing the same thing they did on, that you did. It's open. Building a rapport. About four or five blokes with balaclavas on, just come racing in. So I've tried to get up. So if I'm on a chair like this, they've just smashed me off the chair. So I've grabbed one of them. I've tried to punch one, but I couldn't because I grabbed my arm. So I've bit one of them, especially with these teeth. I could kill someone, right? What you yeah, no cap. You got tooth on top of tooth, layers. Like, it's crazy in there. I see it. Look at that. <laughs> Seriously. So I've tried to bite one of them, and then I can feel... There might be too many in there, too. You said it. I'm just agreeing a knee in my head, then they're trying to plastic off me, but I'm, I'm quite strong, aren't I? So I'm like, oh, no. I've got to try and resist. I've always been told, you've got to try not to be captured. So I'm trying to resist, and I thought I'm trying to escape, because escape at the earliest opportunity. And I've managed to sort of get onto my knees, and then another one's just booting me to the floor. And I've smashed my, I could feel my nose bleeding a bit. I was like, sake. And then they've got the cuffs on me. And then because I, I could hear one, I'm going, he bit me. <laughs> so as they were carrying me out, they, I hit every door on the way out with my head. Then they threw me in the back of a transit van. And you think, is this, am I in the army still? Because it's so bizarre that you're getting basically beaten up on an army camp. So they take your blindfold off and then they're just shouting at you, berating you. Then they'll try a nice tactic where they'll be really friendly to you and they'll sit you in a nice comfortable, would you like a cup of tea? And you're like, oh, this is nice. Would you like this? Would you like some uh, dry boots? Or would you like this? And Oh, and it's so bizarre. It's just the weirdest thing I've ever gone through. They'll sit you in a dog cage and you've got to try and build a rapport with the guard. So you'll go, excuse me, sir, I couldn't have a drink of water, could I? And it'll just, it's got a hose pipe and it just soaks you. Thank you, sir. No, are you married, sir? And he won't speak to you. He was just go, fuck, something like that. And you just got to keep trying. Have you got children, sir? It'll just wet you again. And then some people, but in the other cage, you'll just give up and just think and just sit there. Oh, do you like sports, sir? Uh, and then he'll start talking. Yeah, I don't mind. I like sports. So you've got to try and build that rapport. Why do they put you in a dog cage? Because they can. It's all to do with um, exposure, isn't it? So they keep you outside. you sat in the cold. They'll keep waiting you and they put you in a dog cage because it's just, it's that um, dislocation of expectations. So you're in a different environment that you're not used to. So why would you be in a dog cage? It's because they put you in there. It's all to do with control as well. You're in this tiny little area. It's quite claustrophobic. They do things to, they'll leave a door open and if you can see outside and they'll ask on the debrief if you saw anything or did you think you had a chance to escape or did you think you had a chance to get away at, at all? So that's quite cool that. So you have to remember stuff. And even when they're moving you about with your blindfold on, you'll try and remember how many steps it was from your cell into the interrogation room and which way you went. Those were like, could you draw us a layout of the building? You get, you get released or you escape and there's still three or four of your colleagues in captivity. If you can remember any sort of detail, then the special forces or the military will go and try and get you out. It's so difficult because all you want to do is just switch off. But you've got to remain really alert. You can't though, you got to continue to fight. Mental. 
mentally. That's uh, all the time when you're in captivity. How long were you interrogated for? In? I don't know. They'd sort of take you through. It was... Because time is bizarre, because obviously you've got no watch on. And then they ask you at the end how long you think you've been going for. So you, you try and do little reminders of thinking, right, I can remember when I got taken, it was light. Then when I was outside in a dog cage, it was dark. Then I remember it being light again. So you think, well, it's got to have gone through at least 12 hours of, of time. So I think we went through for about 15, 16 hours. But then some people, like special forces, will go through for 36 hours. They'll go through, which is awful. And I can imagine mentally it's pretty tough as well. What were the... Yeah, it's really draining. Were there dark moments for you? What was the darkest moment during that? I didn't like stress positions. You have to sit with your arms crossed. You can't interlink your fingers because you can have a rest there. So you have to sit like that with your arms on top of your head, sat, legs crossed. And when you're quite big, it, it, quite, it hurts. It starts to hurt your lower back and stuff. And you'll slump forward, so you go, oh, and then the guards will just come and put you in that position again. And you'll be in that stress position for hours. And I can't cross my legs. And it just seems so long because there's no distraction. You've got no phone, nothing. You've got just music playing or you'll have a baby crying or you'll have a generator running or some sort of obscure noise to distract you again. Again, it's that mental, you can't just go into your own space. One of my mates found stress positions quite easy and they liked that. They just drifted off and found it quite comfortable where I was in a lot of pain. I didn't mind being interrogated because I could sort of try and talk around it. And the longer I was being interrogated for, I was, I was sat in a chair or I was in a comfortable position. So I'd try and drag it out. I'd just try and spout a load of shit just to sit there and drink a cup of tea and eat something. Some people hated being interrogated because they thought they were just going to trip up all the time. Unless you've been through it, you can't understand what it's like. It's like that, oh, you weren't there, you've not done it. It's one of them, it's one of them situations where unless you've done it, you wouldn't understand it. But it's so, it's so worthwhile because you need to do it for that empathy. You have to do it. So if I was interrogating you, I can see if you're struggling or I know what you're going through on certain approaches or certain things that are happening to you, and I can see if you, how it's affecting you. And I can know that because I've done it. So that's why you have to do it. So you know in, when people are in pain, if people are like, feigning injury or feigning, that makes sense. I think I'm going to faint, you think, no, nah, they're not. They're totally lying about this. So then you qualify. Where did you go from there? So on SA selection, I, I used to train the recruits, and it's one of the last things they do before they actually get badged into SAS. Those guys go through, it's pretty intense what they go through. Can you tell me a bit about what you're teaching those SAS recruits? Like, We'd, what does it look like if I was going to come and, and do that? Yeah, well, you'd come off, you've passed your part of selection, then you come to us, you come to the uh, escape and evasion phase, they call it. So you'll go on the run, either in Scotland or in Wales somewhere, and you'll go on the run for four or five days. You have no food and you're not allowed to get lifts off anyone or get take food off people. They'll stitch you up and they'll plant people in the countryside that pretend to be a farmer that'll give you food and they'll fail you for it. Then there's a hunter force chasing you. So there's soldiers that come from different units chasing you. If they catch you, they give you a bit of a beating. You'll do like a thrashing and then they'll let you go again. And then eventually you'll go and meet an agent and then they get handed over and then they come to us and then they go through for about a day to a day and a half. And it's really intense. And it's the same process of interrogation. You'll go through a number of different interrogations. It's just longer, more intense and harder. In our interrogation centre, we used to have different rooms. We had a torture room, so it was all black. We'd have chains and like electric shock devices on the floor, so a car battery with plugs on it and stuff like that. And then we'd use, we'd go down the butchers and get animal blood put that on the floor so it smelt like rotting flesh. So it smelt like, you know, that horrible death smell. You've all smelled. No, she don't know. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Smelt death, haven't you? That, you know that smell. So it's quite a pungent smell of rotting blood. You'd put that in there so people when they're blindfolded, you'd just leave them there and you could see them. And it's that smell of something's rotten, something's dead, like a dead carcass. So what kind of things are you teaching them to do then? What are the like, detail of the, the kind of tips that you're giving them and the most important things they need to remember? Stay alive. To, the main thing is to stay alive. You don't want to stand out. You don't want to be highlighted as the most interesting person. 
because that's no good. If you're the most interesting person, why are you the most interesting? You're going to get highlighted straight away. But if you're the the least interesting, why keep hold of you? Just just kill you. So it's that. It's a really tough balance of still being interesting but not giving too much information away. And then we teach them different questioning techniques. So green, amber, red, and different subjects, what they can talk about and when they can talk about. And it's all about being a, having pressure applied on you. So if you were talking to me now and you're putting no pressure on me, you're just sat there on a chair asking me questions, being quite pleasant, I'd just stay green. Nothing that's going to uh, affect my teammates, my unit, my family or anything like that. And then if you started being a bit, a, a little bit more aggressive, passive aggressive, you mentioning the use of weapons and you think, oh, that feels a bit more aggressive now, or you're make, making sort of passive remarks about colleagues and possibly threatening them. If you feel comfortable that you're going to get threatened and it's a bit more pressure has been put on you, go into amber and you talk about amber subjects. And then red is all about threats to life. So imminent threats to your life or imminent threats to a colleague's life. So if me and a colleague were there and they were putting a gun to his or her head, and I'm like, could you live with that? So it's, good, it's a difficult call, isn't it? If they get shot in the head because I'm talking, you've got to live with that for the rest of your life. So you've got to make a call and start giving red information, which is secret information. And there's even some information that you'll still, you've got to make a call, do I want to give this information or do I take it to the grave? And so you have to make that call yourself because only you can do that in captivity. That's interesting. But they train you, at least they train you on it. I, I ain't know nothing about this. You get trained on how to get receive, how to get interrogated and everything. If you get captured by a really hostile enemy force and you deep in enemy lines, which a lot of the times that's where they're working, they're not working at the front, like on a boundary, the, right in deep in enemy lines. So you're going to get treated as a spy. You're going to get beaten up. You're going to get possibly tortured. You're going to get possibly raped. You've got to expect the Why worst outcome. But you have to remain in that situation where you've got to stay alive. How often do people end up like giving information? What's the sort of percentage of people that crack? Everyone will crack. Pretty much everyone will crack because you can't hold out for that long. You, you've got bargaining tools to try and last, but if, if you're getting tortured, you, you're gonna speak, aren't you? If you're getting tortured, you, you're losing toenails, you're losing fingernails, they're cutting fingers off, they're doing things to your colleagues. You, you're gonna have to talk eventually. How do you teach somebody like mental resilience if somebody was kidnapped? Some people do like a grounding technique. So, like, no matter what, well, no matter what, you gonna talk during an interrogation. If you get kidnapped and they get to torturing you, you're gonna talk. This is from an SAS interrogator himself. You are going to talk. It just what? How much info are you gonna give up? And what info? Wedding rings and things like that. So if I feel my wedding ring, it takes me back to sort of my wedding day with my wife and. You, it's like quite a nice grounding thing. Some people think of things like that or certain tattoos or remind people of stuff. But then some people don't want any reminder of home. We'll give them lots of different tools. It's up to them what they use with those tools. Small victories are great because it's all a game, isn't it? It's all trying to beat that person because they're doing horrible, terrible things to you in captivity. We spoke to someone, we debriefed someone who nicked a pen lid and he was well chuffed with that. He wasn't going to do f*** all of it. He's not James Bond. He's not going to stab him up with a pen lid. But he was so happy he'd nicked the pen lid. And then he was like, I've nicked the pen lid. I'm so happy. You're basically giving them the tools to survive and help them. That, that must yeah. feel quite rewarding. Yeah, it is rewarding. A couple of the um, soldiers that went through our training did get captured. And we got to speak to them after. And they used the training and said the training was invaluable. So when you hear stuff like that, it makes it worthwhile. And it was very, what we do is quite realistic to what they, how they got treated which is good to know. Tell me a little bit about how you got into debriefing work as well, please. Yeah, we debrief uh, military and civilian people so that have been in captivity. So I debriefed, we went down to um, Shivana to debrief the around 15 that got taken by the Iranian army. So there was 15 Royal Marines and Navy personnel that got taken. And it was in disputed waters. It was all over the press at the time. 
where one of their ribs that was on got took, was in disputed waters, and the Iranian army basically took them captive. And they paraded them all on, media, on the media, and it made it look like they were being really looked after. One of the Marine officers went on, I think, national TV and was saying, yes, we was in the wrong place at the wrong time, so admitting he was in the wrong. And people, it's easy to sit at home, people sat at home going, what's, what's he saying that for? But they didn't realise what was going on in the background, and we debriefed them. And they were using all different sorts of things against them. So there was, there was one female, and they were using female intimidation, you know, sort of intimidate the female in front of the, the, the blokes, essentially, and saying, if you don't do what I tell you, we'll, we'll put a pistol to her leg and saying, we'll shoot her. And then they were using all different sorts of propaganda. They were making them sit and look like they're having a great time playing board games and they're all sat around and having brews. But as soon as the cameras stopped rolling, they put them back in the cells and they were treated quite harshly. So that was really invaluable because then we can take away so much stuff from that right. and put it into training. Yeah. And then civilians have been taken. Some, some people were in a village in Bosnia were held with no barriers. They were held in the centre circle of a football pitch and there were snipers either end, like gun towers. So if you leave that centre circle, we'll shoot you. So there's not even a fence. You're just sitting in the centre circle of a football pitch. Oh, no, there's a fence. There's a fence of gunfire. Like, I ain't gonna run out of there. So it's that, again, it's that dislocation of expectation. You don't always expect to be held in a cell. You're held in random places. People have been held underground, in little boxes underground. And then they could put pretty much crawl into this little box. And then when they got fed, a little door would open. They'd get fed the, the little shut her clothes again and they had to do all their business in the corner of this box. How much does torture play a role in, in kind of these kidnappings that you're debriefing from? Unfortunately, quite a lot. It depends who's, who's taken you. If, if it's a country that have, uh, abides by the Geneva Convention, you shouldn't be tortured. But if it's a militia group, if you're being taken somewhere where they're a terror group or a militia group, that goes out the window. They've got no rules. They've got no law to abide to. They work on their own. So it really differs. It really differs that how you get treated by who's taken you. What are the most shocking things you've heard from people that you've debriefed? We was talking about one a chap got taken, and I won't mention where either, but he got taken in captivity. And uh, he got beaten up quite a lot, like pretty much every day. And they tried to make him confess, and he said he didn't do it, and he hadn't done it. He was a civilian. And then on Christmas Day, he got raped. And they said they, he said when we spoke to him, it wasn't anything to do because they found him attractive. It was all to do with power and that they could do it just to demoralize him. And it was on Christmas Day, it happened as well. And they just did it because they could. And they tried it a couple of times. Christmas Day upheave is crazy. That didn't work and they moved on to a different tactic. But unfortunately, that happens, and it does happen a lot. What type of Never person do you have to be to be a good SAS interrogator? You need to be a bit of an actor, essentially, because what you're doing and saying to people is awful. So you, the things you're doing to people is terrible. And you don't mean it, but you have to mean it because you don't want to be like that rubbish that drama teacher. That you go, yeah, he's terrible. Ooh, you've been a naughty rotter. You've got to mean it. They've got to feel that horrible threat of they're going to get beaten up or something's going to happen to them or you're being quite sinister. You've got to mean these veiled threats. So you have to be quite genuine. But then you've got to realise that it's not your real job. When that customer leaves and you go back out onto set or into the like, interrogation area, that you're just normal again. You can't be then that weirdo. Yeah, how hard is it to switch between like interrogator Ian and real life Ian? Easy. Seconds, yeah. Yeah. Because I've done it a while now, and I so you can just switch on. So I could just sit and talk to you, and then I would smile, and I just go, "What, what the f are you on about?" So it's it's instant. You feel uncomfortable, don't you? Because I'm talking to you like you're a fucking idiot, which I know you're not. So I'm back out of it again. I can do that too, but it's the Gemini in me. You know what I'm saying? What they say might be true, might not be true. And what did you love about being an SAS interrogator? It was just quite a cool job. It was different. You got to go all over the world. You got to do different things. It was just a cool job. And you just, it was just such a skill to learn that I'm still doing now. 
you mentioned a little bit, but how often do you use your skills as an interrogator in your real life? Probably most days. Most days, probably. Subliminally, I don't even realise I'm doing it sometimes, but yeah. I wonder if you got kids and if they got like girlfriends or boyfriends, you probably interrogate them all the time. That's the W skill. I ain't even gonna lie, for that purpose alone. Probably most days. What kind of things? I'm not telling you that. <laughs> Very interesting stuff. I'm not even gonna lie. SAS interrogator, top tier interrogator. 